So welcome to the Systems First Computer Museum. I'm Bob Roswell, founder and one of the curators. My cameraman today is um, Brendan Becker, and he also has a museum here with um, focusing on music and games. So come visit us when you are able to here in Hunt Valley. Uh, today we're gonna talk about when computers were human. We're going to talk about the calculating aids that human beings used to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and, and of course, more complex uh, things after that. Over here, we're going to start with the very first artifact um, that we got uh, for this business. I told my college roommate that I was going to open up a computer store, and he said, ha, 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 here's your first piece of inventory. And of course, it's an abacus. And this was in 1980, so there was no internet. So I went off and I bought the book. And um, I read the first three pages of the book, and the book doesn't work. What I didn't know at the time is that, uh, like the title says, this book is about a Japanese abacus. So here's a Japanese abacus. Uh, you'll notice it has four earth beads and one heaven bead. This is a Chinese abacus that has five earth beads and two heaven beads. So being, of course, a total nerd, I went out and bought the right book for the wrong abacus and the right abacus for the wrong book. Further come to learn that the Koreans have a different variation of the abacus. This has five earth beads and one heaven bead. And the Russians have a shaki which looks like this. Um, these are the ones, these are the tens, these are the quarter rubles. So that's why there's four beads there. So lots of different ways of um, using an abacus. Uh, there are, on our website, you can use most of these online, um, but I'm not gonna demonstrate them today. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is Napier's bones. So this is John Napier. He was born in 1550 and he died in 1617. He's known in mathematical circles as the uh, discoverer of what today we would call logarithms and exponents. So he discovered them. He discovered that if you added exponents, that was multiplying. And in the late 1500s, he built calculating devices that made multiplication and division much easier. Uh, the original ones were made out of ivory. We're not gonna kill any elephants here. So uh, our, ours here is a wooden replica. So I'm going to pick a three digit number. Here's 867, 867. And the way we use this is 1 times 867 is 867. That's the easiest case. A more complicated case here is 2. So that's 1, add across the diagonal, 7, 3, 4. So 867 times 2 is 1, 7, 3, 4. It can get more complicated when we have carries. So I'm going to start here with 867 times 6. I'm going to make my life easier and start over here. Two in the least significant digit. Zero, because six plus four is 10, carry one. So that's 11 plus the carry is 12. So two, carry one. So it's going to be five, two, zero, two. And that's how you would use Napier's bones. Of course, it works with any number at all. So here's... 867,831 times 6 is 896025. If I have to do a two digit number, I offset them just like you learned how to do multiplication as a child and add up each, each partial. So that's Napier's bones, uh, late 1500s. Uh, that then led Otright to develop the slide rule. Those of us in our mid-60s and older probably used these while we were in high school or college or even in our professional lives um, in my early 60s. So um, I was in the last class in my public high school in New Jersey that was forced to use slide rolls. We can grab a shot over. Um, when I took honors chemistry in 10th grade, 
we spent the first two weeks, the teacher had a large slide rule like this, and we sat at our desk with our small slide rules, and we learned how to do multiplication and division and all the other things we needed to do to put our molds together or whatever we were doing in, in high school chemistry. So um, that represented a really long era, uh, early 1700s until electronic calculators really hit in 1972. Um, slide rules have uh, two major problems with them. The first, which was never conquered, is that you have to do, you have to have another algorithm to keep track of the decimal places. So three, thirty, three billion, three trillion, they're all in the same place on the slide rule. So that was a big problem for all of us who use slide rules. The second problem was resolution. So there's a very small space here between 90 and 100. So that little piece right there is 95. One dot over is 96. Not much space to see the difference between 961 and 962. So that was a problem. We can get approximations on a standard length slide rule, two to three digits, depending upon which scale and where we were on the scale. So what you can do about that is make the slide rule longer. You get more resolution. That might give you another half a place, one, one decimal place with a longer slide rule. And over here, we have Thacker's instrument. So this is sort of the ultimate slide rule. So Thacker in 1891 got a patent on this device. What he did was he took that slide rule and made it 40 feet long. Obviously, if it's 40 feet long, we can't use it. It's too big. It doesn't fit in my cube. So he took the slide rule and took the C scale and divided it up into 18 inch segments. And these are little triangular pieces. There's one side on, on each. And then the D scale is on a very long spiral. So this is effectively the same thing as a linear slide rule. But with a Thacker, we can get uh, five to six digits of precision rather than the two to three that we got on the um, standard slide rules. So slide rules give us an approximation. Um, mechanical calculators um, begin to enter the scene in the 1600s. Chicard, um, others, we don't have any here. They're incredibly rare. But by the late 1800s, we start to get the Industrial Revolution, and you begin with the mass production of mechanical calculators. The 900-pound gorilla here in 1887 would be uh, Dor Felt and Mr. Uh, Robert uh, Tarrant, who started the Comptometer Company, and they mass produced comptometers like this. Fairly simple machine for adding. These are the ones, tens, hundreds. So it's color coded. So that would be $123.45. One, two, three, four, five. And you can set a decimal point right here. So to add, I can hit five plus seven is 12, plus 48 is 60, plus 275 is 335. And then, of course, I can clear it. So that's addition. Subtraction is done by tens complement uh, arithmetic. So if you notice, each of these keys has a big number that's used for adding and a small number that's used for subtraction. This is very much the way modern computers do it. The only difference is we use um, twos complement to do subtraction. The problem here does get harder and harder. Here's a manual from a comptometer. Addition is easy. Multiplication is not so bad. Uh, long division is sort of a pain. Here we're on page 15 of the manual. These are the easy instructions. We're going to divide 63,542 by 77. We're using these little placeholders. We're using our fingers. The directions start here on page 15 go through page 16, go through page 17, and we get our answer. And then here on page 18, we get a review 
that uh, takes two pages for the review. I'm sorry, it takes three pages for the review. You would have seen offices filled with men and women. They were the computers. They are going to use the calculators. And this was a fairly um, skilled job. So I was giving a tour here about a year and a half ago when Mr. Hollifield came in. This is a photocopy of his mother's certificate that she earned on December, in December of 1938, having graduated from Comptometer School. So that's Comptometer land. Um, if you're doing complex arithmetic, there are many, many, many steps. Uh, accuracy is always a problem. So when you took your math from grade school or high school, um, you probably heard the phrase, check your work. And when I do an operation using a comptometer, it's very hard for me to check my work because I don't know whether I press the five in this column or that column, or this column, or I press the big five or the little five, all kinds of mistakes can creep in. And there's no way to audit other than do it again. And if I do it again, I'm likely to make the same mistake twice. <laughs> so we don't like that. So um, Mr. William Seward Burroughs comes along. And I'm going to grab a new sheet of paper here. And he marries a calculator with another existing technology, a typewriter. So uh, we're going to insert a piece of paper in here. All zeros, similar adding 654 plus 5588 is 6242. Give me a subtotal, add my tax, add my freight. I now am at 6341, and give me a grand total. So, very much like we had before. The big difference now, of course, is that I have a full audit trail. So it's very easy for me to go back and proofread and see everything that I've done. As a museum person, one of my favorite things about this Burroughs is that we have a invoice for a service contract on it. Uh, this service contract, as you can see, was valid from May 11th of 1925, and it was good through 11-11 of 25. So somebody paid $4.70 minus a 24 cent discount to have this under service contract. Um, the bad news is the service contract expired uh, 95 years ago. Uh, the good news is they probably didn't need it because except for changing the ribbon, um, this machine still works as you can see. So fun calculator. When you look at the 1880s calculator, when you look at the Burroughs, early 1900s, when you even look at the Monroe in the 1930s, you'll see that they don't look much like modern calculators. They have many, many keys, rows of ones, tens, hundreds, and so forth. In 1917, uh, Dalton invents the 10 key calculator. And I love the ad here. Uh, in very small print there, it says an inexperienced girl and a Dalton will replace two men who figure with a pencil. Uh, look, <laughs> love the political incorrectness of that ad. Anyway, the Dalton hits the market and 10 key machines were not very popular for many years. And once I show you why, it will become incredibly obvious, and we will wonder why our modern calculators don't look much like the older calculators. So I'm going to jump over here to my grandfather's Monroe. He purchased this in the 1930s. Um, obviously, it was after 1917, so he could have had a 10-key calculator. But like most people, my grandfather had 10 fingers. So if he wanted to enter a number like 123, he would do it in parallel. He could, just like a piano player, hit lots of keys at once. So today, even though I can talk to my phone and ask Siri or Alexa to do the arithmetic for me, um, I don't have the ability to enter an entire number at once. 
So data entry is um, in parallel on this style machine, whereas today it's in series because we only have one of each, each digit. So here's our Monroe. Um, it does plug in, weighs about 35 pounds. Uh, everything zeroed out, so I'm going to hit 25 plus 987 is 1,012, and we added two items. We'll clear it. We'll do a multiplication problem. So the repeat key is down, so 25 times 1 is 25, times 2, 3, 4, 5 is 125. Move the decimal over one spot. 25 times 25 is 625. I have more fun with the Monroe than any of my other calculators when it does long division. So to do long division, I'm going to start at the other side. I'm going to type in a nice odd number. There's 137. And I'm going to divide it by 37. So the algorithm here is to repeatedly subtract 37 from 137. It does it once, remainder is 100. It does it again, the remainder is 63. It does it again. The fourth time it subtracts 37 from 137, it gets a negative number. Oops, that's wrong. Add 37 back in. First digit will be three. It's then going to move the decimal over one spot. So now effectively we're subtracting 3.7 from the remainder. It's going to do that seven times successfully move the decimal over again, and continue. So 137, you can try and beat me to it. Divided by 37 is 3.7027. And now we've run out of decimal places, but the answer is right here. So it takes a while to get this done. Um, Monroe was the IBM of the period, but they, of course, had many competitors, lots of defections, lots of corporate history as people went back and forth between Monroe, um, Marchant. So lots of history going on here. Um, the Monroe was really cool, but it has a problem. Um, when I'm done with my calculator now, I put it back in my pocket. Um, this weighs about 35 pounds and requires a plug. So um, not real great for field use. So that led um, Mr. Kurt Hertzark to develop the Curta machines. Hertzark was working on the Curta in Austria before World War II. He was put in the concentration camps, uh, forced to manufacture these for the Third Reich. Um, he lived, um, was sent to a, um, a camp a after the war and then eventually settled in Liechtenstein and began production of the Curta calculators. Uh, these were made from 1947. Uh, the Model 1 was made starting in 1947. The Model 2 came out in 1954, and these were sold until 1972. So we're going to set our 25 again. 25 times 1 is 25, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 25 is 125. Move the decimal over one spot. 25 squared is 625. When I lift this up, it does division. So I just subtracted 10 times 25 and got the answer, which was 375 up here. Brilliant machine. Um, I have a bad habit of taking things apart to understand how they work. Uh, this would be a counterexample because the Model 2 here has only 719 parts and 139 of them are different. Uh, this is the Model 1, which is the same thing, but fewer digits and a little bit smaller. Um, from here, I'd like to actually move back in time a little bit to 1919. And here you're looking at perhaps the most famous calculator in America. Um, doesn't have much competition. Uh, the reason this is the most famous uh, calculator in America is this um, very machine with the serial number did appear on uh, Pawn Stars. So the prior owner took it to the guys at Pawn Stars. And they filmed a segment on it. And you can look it up on our website uh, or, or find it. And, 
the Pawn Star archives. So the millionaire is a really interesting machine because you may have noticed when I was using the Monroe or the Curta, if I wanted to multiply something by five, it was five cranks. If I needed to multiply 25 by 25, it was seven cranks, five cranks in the one position for the five and two cranks in the tens position. On this unit, each decimal, each place only needs one crank. So we're gonna set this, this is addition, multiplication, division, subtraction. I have it set for multiply, making sure everything is zeroed out here, which it's not. 25, 25 times five is 125, only one crank. 25 times two is 50, 25, and the answer here is 625. So it's only one crank, two, two cranks, because it's a two-digit number times a two-digit number. So this is pretty cool. This is uh, invoiced here in August 11th of 1909 for a millionaire calculator. Uh, this the Mossbacker was the sole agent. These were made in, in Switzerland. And the last calculator that I would like to demonstrate today is my favorite. It's also the simplest. Um, it's called Console the Educated Monkey. So here we have a photograph from 1909 of a chimpanzee. His name was Console Peter, and he was trained by his trainer. And the story is that Peter could, his trainer could point to two different numbers, let's say five and seven, and the chimp would scamper over and point to the answer, which would be 35. Um, there was a movie made of this, but no one can seem to find a copy of it. Anyway, Consul Peter was brought to the headquarters of the National Cash Register Company, and an engineer built the educated monkey calculator. So we're going to look at his feet. There's four times seven is 28. Four times eight is 32. Four times 11 is 44. Six times 11 is 66, and so on. I can't physically put two feet together. So if I want five squared, I take it over here to the square icon, and five squared is 25. Uh, here at System Source, we have several hundred different types of calculators on display, many different ways of getting to the same place. So we have AMCOs and summits and Adiators and facets, and um, even variations here. So, here's an original monkey calculator that we just saw. The monkey calculator had different inserts. So, here we're doing addition. If we put this insert behind it, it does addition. And of course, it was cloned. So, here's the queen, and we're looking at the queen five times seven is 35. Just another variation, but this particular one's made out of cardboard. So um, thanks for paying attention today. We also, of course, have lots of computers here. And uh, come and visit us when you have a chance.